immediately, immediately. Um, gunshots rang. I know I saw bullets pass me on fire. This is gonna hurt. You're gonna get shot, but your chances are better if you stay flat. Don't turn, don't blade yourself. Two of those bullets that I saw passing by, uh, one strikes me on the side of the helmet, to the head. It flips me around in the air. Another one hits my back, sapping plate, and kind of thrusts me down to the ground. And, and my Marines too, man. I'm not part of this unit, but we all work together, man. And my staff's are good, man. man. He's such a guy that we could just imagine any minute he's gonna come out of rubble, just, just all good, you know. Kind of like the movies. The warring like the movies. I'm here to tell you that ain't like. All right, Dennis, what's up, man? Hi. I'm good, Josh. Just, <laughs> just glad to be here. Hey, thank you. Uh, we appreciate you coming, man. Appreciate you taking a seat. Thank um, you for having me. So uh, let's just just jump right into it, man. Well, how about you start off with just telling us uh, your name, um, the branch of service you serve under, and uh, what years you served. Okay, uh, Dennis Woolard. I uh, got out and officially '09. I started in, in 1998. I got out as a staff sergeant uh, in the Marine Corps. Okay, so I. Uh, Enjoyed my time. Some difficult uh, situations, but uh, I would do it all over again if I, if I had to. All right. Um, how about we, uh, if you don't mind, let's start off with, uh, you know, I'd like to know a little bit about um, where you're from, where okay. you're born, where you, you know, where you were raised at and, and what life was like for you uh, back then. Okay. I was born and raised in Mississippi. Uh, my formative years were spent on a farm in Covington County, uh, a little place called Collins, Mississippi, is where I uh, grew up for my first formative years, you know, all the way through, I guess, elementary school. Uh, surrounded by, uh, we lived on my grandfather's farm. So if anybody know about farm work, it, it's tough, uh, never ending, but uh, you learn to appreciate stuff. You learn to, uh, I appreciate the hard work and the hard work ethic that I learned from there. Also surrounded by military people. My, both my grandfathers were military. Almost all of my uncles, cousins, they all had military backgrounds. All the way from World War II, Korean conflict, uh, host of uncles that were in, the, in the Vietnam. Uh, uh. So for me, I was surrounded by the culture of service, serve your country. Um, none of them complained. Um, they all came back. Some would uh, tell their stories and I always found that very fascinating. As, as a young child in Covington County, I could um, I had a uncle, his uncle, his name is Lawrence, and he would uh, be candid about some of his experiences there. And with all other kids my age, outside playing or doing other things, um, I was holding on to those stories. Also from my grandfather, who was, he, he was my idol. I, he, um, his service in Europe uh, during World War II and the Korean conflict, I was just, you know, I was hanging on every word right. while everybody else, were, you know, my age were, were playing and, and it just was very fascinating to me. Um, the level of commitment, the level of uh, the hardships that they were willing to share Mm -hmm. with it and, and I, I have to believe that kind of made me who I was it was in me so it just kind of with my grandfather being uh, one of the people persons in my life to, who I most admired um, the hard work on the farm and uh, 
his strong beliefs, his, his um, spiritual background, um, belief in God, and, and all of that were, were very formidable to me uh, in those years. Mm. So that, I, I have to credit that to um, guiding me in, in the way of, of uh, joining, joining the military. All right. Yeah. Sounds like they were your, your, your inspiration for sure, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, did you play any sports growing up? Do you have any um, siblings, brothers and sisters? Yes, I did. I, I have a brother, a younger brother, who's also military. He just recently retired from the Army. Um, did multiple uh, trips to Iraq, multiple tours to Afghanistan. Uh, he was in the intel um community. Uh, I believe we were even in Iraq at the same time, which wow. I don't know how that happened, but hey, it happened. Yeah. Um, pretty much um, influenced much in the way that I was. Even though he was five years younger, he didn't get all of the hard work that we had to do, but uh, and I kind of kid him about it. And so by the time he came through, there was no cotton. There was a lot of stuff we were doing mm -hmm. stuff by fall, by uh, tractor and and uh, even contracting some of the work out. And you know, I say, oh, you 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 came up to easy times, but he was a tough. He's a tough cookie. Yeah, um, he's recently retired now. He's a um, he has two daughters, so he's a a, a girl dad. Mm. And uh, that's the joy of his life. When he got out alive, well, we're both grateful, thankful to God that we uh, ended our military service alive with most of our faculties on all of our limbs. Mm. So, um, What year did you go in, Dennis? I went in in 98. 1998. 1998 on a reserve contract as a... Uh, communications first MOS. I um, I was living in Peoria, Illinois, which was closest to a um, engineer um, unit. So I went back to school to be an engineer. Um, loved it, loved all the explosives, playing with all of the, that stuff. I, I wanted to amp my military service up a little bit I found out there was a, um, a force reconnaissance unit uh, close to my hometown, Mobile, Alabama, 3rd Force Reconnaissance. So I went down and uh, went through the end dock and everything and had some wonderful partners down there to 3rd uh, Force Reconnaissance. Learned a lot, worked my butt off. I had a civilian job as a police officer. I was working in Harrison County uh, Sheriff's Department. Life was wonderful. 9-11 hit. Okay, so immediately, all right, been in this in this special forces, the Marsoc community. Immediately we start calling, wondering, okay, somebody just attacked us. Uh, what what are we gonna do about it? And what are we gonna do as a unit? What so we're waiting orders, waiting. Our sister unit, which is the Intel unit, they're immediately gone. They're out. So we're standing around. And we started to realize there were problems yeah. uh, for us getting deployed. Well, we weren't going to get invited into the theater later because of some mistakes made uh, from the Gulf War. Okay. Mm. So much of my unit started disbanding, going to third, first and second uh, reconnaissance. I had a friend. Um, that I worked out with I was from the Amtrak unit there in Gulfport. He said, uh, hey, he was a major. He said, we're going to deploy. We're going to go more than any other unit. So I just, at this point in my mind, I'm like, how do I get into this fight? Um, pretty much compatible to my life. I have a small business operating and uh, doing the... Uh, police work, how do I get into this fight? And um, so I ended up signing up with the uh, the um, Amtrak unit there in uh, out of Gulfport, Mississippi. Hmm. And like he said, and it was it, it pretty much immediate. Okay, come on, 
I was uh, I went there as the uh, communications sergeant, and it was almost immediate. We we were going over to uh, Kuwait, awaiting orders to go into uh, Iraq on the initial push in 2003. Mm. So um, my job pretty much make sure the radios were up. And once the radios and once everybody's communicating, I were I was okay to leave the track, whatever grunt unit that we that we had. I would get familiar with uh, whoever we had, we were with. At that time, we was with three one, and um, told them a little bit about my background, the special, uh, uh, just coming over from under in the Marsaw community, mm -hmm. and they. Welcome me with open arms. You want to leave the track? You want to come out and go on patrol with us? I said, sure, I would love to. Mm. And uh, that kind of established the precedence of of my dual dual job. Uh, did what I had to do as far as the communications part. Make sure whatever Amtrak uh, crew I was with were protected and in a pretty good. Uh, spot mm -hmm. so i got to go out and be the grunt person that uh i know that i am yeah so it, it worked for me that it was you know i would have loved to go on over as a force reconnaissance and do those kind of things but i was with the group that i felt needed me they uh they loved having me around they affectionately call me big woo <laughs> and they love having me around and Part of it was because of that uh, that grunt experience. They know I love them. And I would take a bullet for any one of them, and um, their safety and getting them back to their home, to their parents, their wives, their kids, yeah. um, was what I was about. That's what I preached in training while we were in the garrison, and <clears throat> train hard. Every day is a, is a um, a reckoning day when it comes down to training you train hard so when the real thing happens uh we'll be prepared and uh, and many of them bought off on what we were trying to do there as far as the training mm -hmm. because um, we never expect you never can prepare totally you don't know what you're gonna um, get what rd you're gonna uh, be exposed to, right? But uh, um, when you, uh, how long did you stay in Kuwait? When you got to Kuwait before you headed into Iraq? Well, our first workup was out here on the east, on the west coast, down in um, Camp Pendleton, and we did kind of a, a little training, and we went to the mount training and, and a lot of little stuff, and. Uh, I would say about a month to six weeks. I may be off a little bit mm -hmm. this was some time. Uh, but uh, I remember sitting on the tarmac waiting because we were flying over instead of taking the ships. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember leaving the tarmac, going back to your room, hey, it was a dry run, not going. Then we got finally got a call, kind of, kind of like middle of the night, kind of hurry up get to get you guys to on the tarmac. It's the real thing this time. So, um, this is from yeah. Kuwait. Already? Th this is from uh, Pendleton. Pendleton. Oh, okay, and then we end up in Kuwait, and mm. then we sit there probably another couple weeks, three weeks before um, we actually get on the tracks and and, and move to the uh, border, mm. the southern border of Iraq. Yeah. You know, we. Uh, I remember General Maddox, Maddox giving um, us a speech and, and talking to us, and we were ready. We were ready. Uh, uh, we were hearing little rumors at that point in time that it's very unpopular around the world, and nobody's really on board with what we're doing. And I said, "Well, you know, we we're here, and we have a mission to do." You know, and we're gonna go forward with this. You know, right? You know how you hear 
rumors. You don't really have any contact back home. We weren't allowed to talk talk about anything. So, you know. Yeah. Just, but the fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter. You're you're there, and you got a mission to complete, right. and then that's that. <laughs> yes. And it's all about the man to the right and to the left. It's always that's what it's always been to me. Um, so, how was that initial push into Iraq for you? It was um, a lot. It's a lot of carnage uh, from the air airships and um, prep. So uh, we went into that Nazaria. Uh, what, on our way to Nazaria, the, the uh, hose clamp on, on the radiator uh, for our AEV came off, and we thought we had a blown motor, a blown what they call a pack. So we pulled over. It stopped our whole movement. Um, for a whole battalion in mm -hmm. one track. So while we were waiting, another uh, unit bypassed us. They were on five tons and with sandbags on them. And so they got ahead of us. So while we realized it wasn't a blown engine, we just needed to put the clamp back on the radiator hose and refill it with, uh, with, with cooler. Okay. But that the battalion got ahead of us. So as we were going into that Nazaria, um, there was this huge medevac scene set up where wounded marine, marines and uh, it, it, it was it was bad. It was our first sight of of uh, our guys getting hurt and uh, injuries and deaths on our side. So mm -hmm. uh, first time seeing marines injured, it was like ah. Oh, this is bad. Who is this unit? Well, that's the unit that just passed you guys up. That would have been you guys if it wasn't if it wasn't for the hose that came off mm. of the radiator on your pack. I said maybe we would have been better suited because we were in Amtrak. They were just in five ton. Regardless, we're there. Our Marines, and we have more Marines in there that are, are trapped. What are we doing about it? So we sit there wondering why, what's going on. Again, General Maddox shows up, and he was, he had the mad dog type mentality that that he's so famous for. And why you guys are not in there? Get in there, and help those Marines out. So our mission was to get in there, make sure that the uh, path is clear. So people can continue, other battalions continue to go through Al Nazaria, and so we can provide support for the Marines that are that are pinned down in there, the missing, the wounded, get them out. So it was like twelve hours of continuous gunfight, gunfighting in that uh, the town of Al Nazaria. Continuous, I would say. Um, again, I was able to get off the track and, and go in and um, assist 3-1 who, we, who we were with. And those guys did an amazing job. Um, and we did what we were asked to do, is make sure that that, uh, that, that uh, roadway, that avenue, uh, was clear. Mm -hmm. And uh, continue to support the Marines that were pinned down in, in Anazaria. So, that was the first little taste of combat. Okay. And that would eventually be the biggest, you know, major incident of combat uh, um, engagement of that deployment. You know, we'd go on up to Baghdad. Um, do, we had a little small firefights on, on the way there, uh, securing Baghdad, we're going out on patrols. Um, three times a day. And um, eventually we got the call to retrograde and come back to Kuwait and, we, and come home. Mm. Somewhere around the end of uh, 2003. So I went back to my civilian job as a police officer. Um, some would say a little too soon, but uh, yeah, you know, um, it all worked out. When you were in, uh, uh, in that, you know, Nazaria, um, you know, 12 hour battle. Um, what role specifically did you play? Do you, do you remember? Um, we got off the track. We lined um, 
sides of the street because the, the, the street that we were in charge of taking it, it had bends and turns and we were concerned about the crossfire. But uh, we, we got in a position where we could uh, provide security, make sure our guys were coming through, make sure um, we sent little patrols out to make sure that uh, we check buildings, make sure they're free of RPGs, anything that would hurt our people that would uh, that were trying to come through. Yeah. So that was our major concern. Did you guys lose anybody while you were there during that battle? No, we didn't lose anybody. Uh, none, none wounded. No KIA. No MIA. No WIA. And you completed the mission. We completed the mission. And, uh, we were forced. Mm. Um, how long did you spend there? We spent approximately six months, six to eight, six to seven months in, in country mm. during that deployment. Um, I may be off a little. Yeah, a yeah. Few months to work up. Uh, I know I did a year of active duty. And that included work up inside uh, here in the States and uh, the time waiting. Uh, so it was a year total, but uh, actually in country about six months. Yeah. Um, you know, what's going through your head, Dennis, when you're, you know, you're in this, you know, fight, you know, for 12 hours, obviously, you, you know, in the midst of it, you don't know how long it's going to be. Uh, you don't know, you know, you don't have really any ending in sight. Um, you know, I just, what's going through your mind while all this is going on? Uh, you know, uh, just thinking about, you know, one moment you're in Kuwait, mm -hmm. probably everything's good. You're eating some good chow from the chow hall there, you know, and, uh, and then another moment you're in this, you know, deep in the shit in Nazaria. Um, yeah. Did you even have time to think of anything or was it just training kicked in and you just did what you had to do or, you know, just curious to know what was going through your mind. Yeah, I I look back, I you know, I'm like, I was hungry for it. I'm on all those years of training, all of um, the stuff we did at, uh, at Force Reconnaissance, all of that, finally getting to uh, use some of those skills we developed. And I was glad to do it, but I also wanted uh, to make sure that our Marines performed and we're safe and going and, and getting back on um, on our mission and, and carrying on. Um, that was just who I was. A lot of those guys from 3-1, they won't stop loss, meaning stop loss was, uh, they were, they had end of service, they were into their contract, but they were held over after their end of contract. And they weren't ashamed to tell us, and I, we're stop loss. So I, I, I was supposed to have been out, but uh, we just left uh, Djibouti, South Africa, and we were supposed to go home, and I was supposed to go on with the rest of my life. So, but uh, they were on board. At this, this is just how the cookie crumbles. Um, but uh, you know, if it comes down to it, we're gonna do what we have to do. Right. Very fortunate to be to be able to serve with those guys. So, um, you know, that was your initial contact, right? Like your first, sounds like your first, like, okay, shit, we're, this is combat. Yes. We're in combat. Um, once that, you know, that, that initial contact ended and you, you guys were able to push forward, um, you know, did, did, do you recall any moments when you had, you know, time to think like what just happened? Um, uh, yeah. Um, it was a little time because, you know, we were traveling and, and yet, you know, you had the time to, like, we did it. It's just come back. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what the next few minutes hold, hold. but uh, that was pretty intense. And um, grateful that we made it out. Um, so our first little test of combat, we, we really, we felt like it, it was a, a success. We didn't lose anybody and we completed the mission. And 
So that's a success. Yeah. Um, and then you said you pushed forward, you got into, you know, uh, I guess, um, I hate to call it minor firefights because anytime you're getting fucking shot at, it's not minor, right. <laughs> yeah. whether it's yeah. one bullet or a thousand, right? So, right. Yeah. Um, okay. So you did your time there and then you, you, you came back and, uh, what was it, what was it like for you being back in garrison, um, you know, after, you know, you know, being part of the invasion of Iraq? Well, it was uh, a sense of pride, and we came home to um, a lot of people in, in Mississippi. Uh, a lot of people were applauding us, and, you know, we, uh, some call us heroes, some, you know, um, but basically a thumbs up from our community. So that always feels good when, uh, you know, you, you guys come home, and we brought everybody back. And it was, um, it, it was felt, it felt good. Mm -hmm. I served my country and um, I can think about, you know, my grandfathers and my uh, uncles and I'm like, I'm part of that legacy now too, you know, mm -hmm. uh, combat veteran. So uh, it felt, it felt good. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you leave the battlefield, there's uh, bruised emotions and, and stuff about you know what we had to do and taking the life and and doing and you have to try to compartmental and bring yourself to grips with uh, you know what we uh, had to do but uh, you know, believe in the mission I I knew when I put this uh, uniform on this camouflage and they gave us this M16 and uh, I knew combat was a possibility and we'd actually have to use it and we would, would actually have to kill somebody maybe and um, it was all the way the cookie crumbles and but when it actually happens in reality there there are some things that, that go through your mind and, you know you, your support system and how you handle everybody handles stuff differently but I'm also in law enforcement and every day uh, you, you got the side arm. I got my um, my backup pistol, and I have them for a reason. I may have to use it to save someone's life, save my life, save my partner's life. And um, in your mind, you prepare yourself. Can you do it? And, I, and I've said yes, I can do it. If I need to, I will. Um, after having been through a uh, um war uh did you ever notice any any changes uh about you uh, 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 like any mood uh mood changes anxiety uh you know do you ever you know p any symptoms of ptsd um you know anything like that you know i'm just curious to know if you no you know noticed any of that about yourself like if it affected you once you got back yeah i i noticed and you know it's usually in the form of people telling you and you know i didn't really notice it but uh the the wife my first wife at the time i was uh very outspoken i came out more you know that things weren't right i'd say they weren't right where before i kind of let things go let's stay at home at work, I'm always, I, I, the position I was in, I have to be on top of things. I'm a, I was a leader, I was a uh, sergeant there in the uh, Harrison County Sheriff's Detention Center. So you have to be on it at work. Mm -hmm. I was a little bit, uh, my temper was a little bit, um, my fuse was a little shorter. Mm -hmm. And it started coming to me and people, you know, hey, you okay? You're being okay. So I, I realized, and I, I took a step back. Took me a good vacation and tried to work things out that way. Um, and um, not really seeking any professional help, even though I I encouraged it throughout my to my troops. Hey guys, if you're not feeling good, if you're not seeing things just right, 
at home, you're you're angry a lot, uh, hyper vigilant, which I was hyper vigilant, just just worrying about just. Um, but ultimately, so I you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, veterans who serve in law enforcement, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, I know that you know one of the um, you know symptoms of like PTSD or you know coming back from war like that is uh you know hyper vigilance uh yes i mean it's just a natural thing um however um you know, tell me if you relate to this uh you know when i was in law enforcement it actually it actually worked to my benefit being hi hyper vigilant yeah. because it's almost you're like in a combat mode when right. you're out on the streets right yes. um because you ha can you explain that because you have to be a, a, i mean yeah. at least in, in when you're in iraq you got your battalion, you're pushing forward, you kind of know where the enemy's at. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in law enforcement, you could be taking a break, parked under a tree, sipping on some coffee, and you have no clue somebody comes up behind you and all of a sudden you're in the middle of a fight for your life scenario. Is that right? That's correct. The, you know, the hypervigilance, you know, it was an, an asset. I consider it an asset, of course, on the job. Not so good at home when we're trying to get some sleep. Mm -hmm. But uh, actually, you know, there are no lines. There are no friendly lines in law enforcement. It's always 360 degree awareness, 360 degree security. And because you could get it from any direction. Normally in wartime, there is a front. We know the enemy is somewhere past this line. They're over there. We have our friendlies to our back and uh, to our flanks, um, law enforcement is just, is, is not like that. And the hypervigilance does help, mm. it does. Um, have you ever uh, gotten professional help? I eventually did. I, I, you know, I fought it. My whole thing was, okay, this is the first war and, and conflict that our country have seen in a while. And now we represent the returning uh, veterans from that war. And I wanted to project a picture of strength. Hey guys, even though we have been to war, we've done our thing, we're still horrible. We're still gonna make good cops. We're gonna make um, post office guys, doctors, lawyers, whatever, whatever profession you choose. Uh, be, you know, some of the things that, that happened from the Vietnam era is when they returned back, uh, some of the guys didn't do so well. So mm -hmm. trying to create that, uh, that narrative that, yeah, we're okay. Hire us, you know, uh, support us because we need those jobs when we get back and, and, um, and that we're okay. So right. a lot of that made me kind of like it's kind of tamp down what was really going on inside mm -hmm. to kind of put on this face that yeah everything is good everything you know no problem here man i'm good especially in law enforcement man, yeah, man i'm good mm -hmm. no, no problems but inside I, I knew that um there was there was some there was some issues and going on at home Definitely. Yeah. Um, do you ever get this feeling of uh, maybe, you know, uh, talking about that um, will give the perception, you know, of other people of you being weak? Because, uh, you know, I'm saying that because I know there's a lot of vets, you know, including myself at one point where, you know, you don't want to let nobody know, like, it's hard for me to sleep. Uh, I got ang I'm anxious. Uh, uh, you know, I don't like being in big crowds. Uh, I got to sit with my door behind you know, my back behind the door here. It's like, you know, I know for me, uh, people are like, you know, I think like, I don't want to really talk about that because people are going to think I'm crazy or you know, right. wacko yeah. Yeah. or weak. Um, um, how was it for you? Does that make it hard for you to go seek help? Yes, like absolutely. That? And um, in the black community, you know, we we've come a long way. But uh, where we were during the first times where I probably should have been getting, getting help, yeah, I didn't want that stigma. I didn't want that stigma follow me, you know, into 
my profession of law enforcement. So you have that burden of uh, trying to project a, put a, a, a happy face on. And then when something does go south or you lose your temporal composure, oh, he's shell shocked. Oh, as if he, they didn't have the, even the PTSD terminology wasn't out the way it is now. Uh, they were calling it shell shock or he, he's just burned out from, from the war or something like that. So you def, there was a twofold pressure. And if I go see somebody, you know, how to not only how is it looked upon, if somebody finds out, how do I feel about myself? What's going to go on in there? Do I really want somebody opening me up? Do they really want to know what I'm thinking? And I don't know how they're going to be able to handle what is it, the real truth about how I'm feeling. Right. You know, so that is all of those those issues that add to the stress. Um, so, but we've come a long way. Yeah. So that I'm I'm open. I you know I can say um, the counseling and the um, the therapy that I that I've received was very helpful. It um, you know it pulled the scab off some things and allowed it to heal the right way, the proper way. And I, you know, I'm able to restore relationships that I've uh, burned, and um, especially with my children. And uh, it's a great thing. Yeah. Um, now, when you got out, um, <clears throat> how long after being um, uh, in combat, uh, how long were you back uh, in the States as a civilian, you know, from, from being in combat? Was there a big gap? of you coming back and then getting out of the Marines? No, actually two, two years pretty much to the date, you got the call again to go back into Iraq the, uh, uh, for a second deployment. Oh, really? And so, um, you know, we went to Camp Lejeune, did the work up there, ended up going to um, uh, Iraq. Uh, we had the Euphrates Corridor, which at that point was very hostile. So we knew we were in for a much different type of uh, engagement there. And we were uh, tasked with doing um, engagements all along the, the Euphrates corridor, even all the way out to uh, the Syrian border. And that um, we went into it with, okay, we had our first test to come back, we were successful. Everything went well. We brought everybody back, but we were new. we were warned, and I knew in my feeling this was different. We were going into something uh, different. It was a um, political year. Um, new president, you know. What year was this? Uh, this was oh five oh six. Mm. Yeah, oh five. Um, it just came through the election, which was uh, 04, um, Bush versus Kerry. Mm -hmm. A lot of Kerry supporters, uh, whatever. Uh, hey guys, this is our mission. And uh, President Bush is our, is our president at that time. And so we, we just, you know, we went forward. Um, we were with uh, 225 out of Ohio, Ohio there. That's who we were made up with at that time. A reserve unit? Reserve, no, reserve unit. Okay. Yes. So we conducted the operations and, you know, uh, minor conflicts. Sometime we were getting engaged with, uh, they were testing us when we first got there. What we, what we know about the way they operate mm -hmm. is they test. They know, they know we were new. Um, to the engagement, but uh, and I don't believe we responded appropriately in those tasks. And then they figured us for being weak, and then that's when they we we caused a lot more problems on the back end. Mm. What kind uh, of problems? That's just personal feelings. We end up um, the IEDs got stronger. They went from we watched them go from 
Oh, they knocked the wheel off of a off of a Humvee. Maybe knocked the track off of uh, one of our AVs. Not a big deal. We pull over and fix it, or salt through the through the ID, set up your uh, security and whatever. And then we saw them, um, complete kill ID, where they would uh, invert the 155 shells uh, upward. Packet full of explosives, and they position it with uh, pressure plates. Total, total kill. Up on up armored vehicles, uh, Humvees, nothing left. Knocking the tops off, off the, the tear it off of tanks, and um, we've had two AVs totally destroyed. That I personally saw. I was riding in one. Total destru destruction. So. Their shift in tactics, in which they are known to do, they try something, it doesn't work. They adjust their tactics very well. That's one thing they, they do very well. So you were riding in one that, that destroyed how many, how many other Marines were in there? Yeah, there were 16 on board, uh, nine died. Um, we got everybody off except three. Three never made it off. So uh, fortunate to get off of that. It was in uh, Operation Matador. It Operation was, Matador. Yeah, it was on the, uh, the Syrian border. So we went out to Hakuniel, which we had done times before, to assist them. Um, we wanted to try to do an operation, offensive operation, because they were getting hammered. They were getting overrun, and it was truly... Uh, a tough place to be. We had our, you know, we were in the dam at Haditha, Haditha Dam. Uh, we had our mortars and rocket problems as well, um, but nothing like what they were having in Hakuniel, out close to the Syrian border. They, they were really having problems. So we, they, um, we, they decided we could do an offensive out there to try to make things better. Um, so we went out there, Operation Matador. Uh, we set out, we go into one objective and we started taking a fire from a town called New Albany. It wasn't even our objective. We were heading past it, but they wanted to fight. It was an old Saddam military base where military uh, people lived. So the houses were kind of more structured than so we decided to go pay them a visit they were shooting at the helicopters and everything so we had air support so we uh we went in uh conducted operations throughout the, the houses booby trap we had small arms fire rpg fire but to that point we were except for small injuries i call them small but they were gunshot injuries throughout the most of that day, we were pretty successful. Those that wanted to fight, uh, we took care of them. Those that fled, they fled out the back, and they were hit by uh, helicopter gunfire. So uh, either way, we, we, we made a big statement there, and we were having success that day. I remember getting to the last house that day. I was out with, uh, with the grunts, you know, uh, I fell in with a fire team, and and so I was able to do what I had been doing previously. And uh, did my job on with the tracks, and then go out and 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 uh, be with the grunts and, and do the grunt type work. We were coming to the last house, very hot. I remember the temperature being up close to 130. Uh, the water was just too, too hot to even drink from the canteen, mm. uh, from, the, from the camelback. Um, I was getting ready to contact a guy. He was very, we, we found him, he was across the street. He was in a house full of women. And we kind of knew this was kind of weird for this culture. Why are you the only guy male in this house? Something's going on. He's nervous, he's smoking cigarettes. Went up, no, so I saw a call for an interpreter. I want to pick this guy's brain. 
Okay, so the rest, the rest of my fire team, like, come on, well, look, hey, we just got one, one more house. I was a breach guy. I was the guy that uh, knocked, you know, kick in the door, ram, pick. I had all of that stuff. So I said, I really need, to, we really need to talk to this guy. So right then, some shots start firing. But uh, they were outgoing. Our snipers were taking care of some business. So when we, when we looked up, he was gone. And he had, he lived right across the street. So I was concerned about, because he, he had that look on his face. The police work that uh, I could tell this guy wanted to talk. Mm-hmm. He had something on this that was burdened that was he ne- needed to say. So needless to say, we did not get to speak to that gentleman. So we went on to his house, which was across the street. I was a little late because they had come on, it was the last house. We're gonna, we're gonna get some chow. We're gonna go, um, we're gonna get some rest, get out of the heat. We're done for the day after this last house. The minute the guy kicked the door, which would have been my job, all hell broke loose. I mean, all hell. RPG, small arms, everything. I was a little late. I was trying to catch up too. And, you know, we had been in the last house. We didn't, we weren't perfectly stacked. And in this instance, it was probably a good thing. I probably wouldn't be here. So immediately, immediately, um, gunshots rang. I know I saw bullets pass me on fire. And I just remember. You know, going back to, uh, I don't know whether it's Marine Corps training or police training. Remember, stay flat. This is going to hurt. You're going to get shot. But your chances are better if you stay flat. Don't turn. Don't blade yourself. So these things are going through my mind, and I'm actually getting shot at. I've been through combat. I've heard the bullets whiz by, but this is going down. This is, this is really happening. So... I threw those bullets that I saw passing by. Uh, one strikes me on the side of the helmet in the head. It flips me around in the air. Another one hits my back sapping plate and kind of thrusts me down through the ground. I remember people said, well, what does it feel like to be shot? I, I, I compare it to if somebody put a aluminum baseball bat and in the fire and just hits you with the hot aluminum baseball bat. That was my experience. That's how I I feel. Mm. Down on that ground, um, if there's anything to be thankful for, I I can say, well, at least I'm I'm down on the ground. There was no cover. But coming through the gate and the way some of those houses were set up, once you go through the gate and you enter the courtyard, there's nothing between the courtyard and the front door. So once he kicked that door, which was the trigger for the suicide gunmen who were inside, they were suicide bunkered inside. They had no plans of leaving. This was not a try to escape plan. They were willing to die in that house, but they wanted to take as many Marines as they could with us. So after getting shot in the head, in the back, I'm on the ground. I happened to be already positioned toward the gate on the ground. And I just remember I can't get low enough. I mean, it's still small on fire. I had no use of my legs. So I didn't know the extent of my injuries. I know I was hurting. I know ear ringing, everything was going on. But I do have my arms. So I said, just using my arms. Still nothing in my legs. It's just, uh, so I, I get outside the gate. Um, I cannot do an assessment. I said, I'm not dead. What's up with these legs? And I, I feel the warm liquid going down my pants and on my legs. And oh my God, is that blood? Is you know I've never been injured like this. I don't know what it feels. I realized that they shot through my, my camel bag, and the and the water inside was so hot that it, it felt like. It could possibly be blood or whatever. Mm. So I do an assessment in the legs, feeling gets back in my legs. All this is happening so fast, an assessment. And I'm hearing my 
and I train. Get back in the fight. Get back in the fight. So I did. So I'm getting back in the fight. I dump some rounds into the um, into the house. I see movement in the big bay window uh, right there in the front room. I see movement. I gauge and engage that target. Um, believe I shot him. Believe I did. The um, but I see my partner still inside there. Um, Staff Sergeant Goodwin, awesome guy. He was the platoon commander and that I was working for. And awesome guy. He was previous SF guy. So we, we had this bond. Uh, Delta Force, he, you know, he was all about it. He, he also always had a plan. Awesome leader, awesome combat leader. So he, he said, throwing a grenade and throwing smoke, we'll go in there and get our guys. So he, he gives that command. Um, uh, other other gunner side, he went right. Uh, Steps on Google went left. I went right up the middle. Um, grabbed um, the first wounded. Um, keep you know, you know keep his name out of it, you know. But uh, I knew these guys and sit with them, ate chow with them. You know, they were like my guys. Right. Well. So uh, we had them off the front porch, drug him out behind the wall. Um, the other guy, he was off to the right. He had been gut shot, okay, and immediately was going in the shot. The, uh, the same weapon that struck me in the head and the back had gotten right underneath his sappy plate. So a lot of his entrails were hanging out and, we were trying to put him back. And so I pulled him back behind the wall. Uh, another one of the Marines, he'd also been got shot, shot in the lower extremities, uh, alive though. So I went and, and grabbed him. All, all of this, well, I'm just feeling like the next minute, one of those rounds is gonna hit me again. Right, right here. I didn't care. That point, I was. It was. I was about. It was about the mission. The mission for me at that point, get those guys out of harm's way. We can. We can drop ordnance on this house, but we'll get our guys out of the, out of, the, mm -hmm. out of that area. Uh, get them to a safe place. Our medic, he had gotten shot in the hand, and it, the bullet came out of his uh, elbow. Awesome, awesome guy. He was, he was still trying to render aid with his arm blown up. I mean, completely blown up. The free arm that he had did have, he was still rendering aid. And I said, man, it was uh, definitely a spree to court moment. Um, so we get those guys out, get them on the Amtrak, and try to give them the best chance uh, that we could to get them survived. Neither one survived. Uh, the medic did. I I survived out of that four man four, four, uh, fire team. We're the only survivors. Mm -hmm. Now, Staff Sergeant Goodwin, the platoon commander, uh, Gunny Hurley, who had gone right, um, Staff Sergeant Goodwin had gone left. Um, he went into the house because somebody ran out. Our sniper shot the guy who ran out, and I think it was one of the guys that I had wounded while shooting through the bay glass window. The so he ran out the back, the sniper shot him, finished him off. So our staff sergeant went in for whatever reason, I don't know, never in the world ever second guess his tactics. Because he always had a plan. He was an awesome guy. But uh, there were more than one gunman. And he didn't know that. He went out the back. He came back into the residence. Other gunmen opened up and, and shot him. So now we got a problem. We got our commander, awesome leader, is down inside the house. So we can't just drop ordinance on it right away. And so throughout that night, we continued to send wave after wave. Oh man, the Esprit de Corps was in big time. We never 
was a shortage of people willing to try to go in and get their commandment out. And that, um, you know, my my wounds, I was treated at the, um, for the, for the amount of wounds, the, the ear, the, um, the grazing head wound, um, no injury to the back because of the sappy play. So I'm biting on the bullet, ready to get back into the fight. Eventually, we end up dropping ordinance on the house, checking it the next day, retrieving uh, the body, um, what we could. And um, the story's kind of ambiguous as to uh, what the complete BDA, battle damage assessment, was behind that. But um, we were able to get Stefan Goodman's body out. And that, mm -hmm. uh, that was great. But um, we, lo we lost a lot of, we had a lot of casualties, a lot of wounded in action, because after the wave after wave that went back into that house, uh, that suicide bunker, every time there was somebody getting injured, trying to not leave our man behind until finally battalion says, we're not sending anybody in, everybody back off, everybody out. And we're gonna drop ordinance on it in a way that we could still retrieve the body. All right, so we bag out, we let uh, do the countdown, explosion. But at that time it's dark, middle of the night, none of us sleep that night, I remember. Standing out, my man. I want my staff so good, man. man. He's such a guy that we could just imagine any minute he's gonna come out of the rubble, just, just all good, you know. Kind of like the movies. The war ain't like the movies. I'm here to tell you, they ain't like it. No, but uh, lost a good man, lost some good guys that day, and uh. We come to find out the house that we dropped the bomb on was the house next to it. It wasn't actually the house we ejected. So we still got a problem, potential problem the next day. So we sent a guy on, on the roof to another house across the street. He shoots the house with a small rocket and brings what's left of it down because we've done everything. We fired, we'd hit that tank with that, that house with two main tank rounds, kind of mouse hole in it. In a shoot at an angle that where he knew Staff Sergeant's body was in the house, shoot it at an angle where we can mouse hole it and go in at a different angle and hopefully at least get to see where the suicide bunker, uh, bunker guys are. And it was a huge mission to try to go in there. It's like going into a closet. You don't see, all you see in it's, it's projectiles coming at you. You don't know where they're coming from. You can't put out, you can't. He would return a good, good, a good fire. Very successful um, suicide bunker situation. So, and it, needless to say, we were able to get to retrieve the body. A small rocket brought it down completely. Um, so now we we're sitting in the middle of operation. Operation Matador is still going. We have other people out doing things. We stand down for. A uh, couple of days. That was, uh, I think, May fifth. So we we're waiting for reinforcements to come from Al Assad, um, somebody to replace Staff Sergeant Goodman, if th that was possible. Awesome guy, but uh, they found the guy, Staff Sergeant Ivy, even more badass, even just as badass. Come from the same. As a matter of fact, they were partners. They guarded the general SF community. Awesome guys. Immediately he talked to me. We we talked it up and he's like, um we he was talking about his, his love for Seth Sorry and Goodwin and how they met and worked together. He said, uh, but then he pulled out a picture of his little girl and said, No, we're not getting anything that we don't have to. It's not mission. You got me on that? I said, yeah, I got you on that. I'm good. I'm good. Let's get our guys out of here. Let's get through this mission. Hit our mission. And our mission, then we 
grab a bunch of crates of C4, and uh, we were gonna blow some caves up, some caves, some of y'all caves from Syria into Iraq. So, um, so now we have some more new guys to some new Marines. We kind of give them a hard time, you know. Hey, just try not to get yourself killed and get us killed. Okay, while you guys have been in the rear, you know, enjoying your life and you know, giving them a little hard time. Right. You know, a little you know, a little banter. Yeah. A little marine banter and stuff. And I say, hey, yeah, you know, and we welcome them. Hey, thank you for coming out and and um let's be motivated. We took a hit, but now we're back. We're still serviceable, we're ready to get back into the fight. They need us back into the fight. Um, so what do we do? Immediately after we leave out the out, while we were leaving out of friendly lines, a tank up front, a uh, couple AVs in front of us, we like the third vehicle. We hit an IED. Right out of the gate. Two days after the, the suicide bug. Uh, I'm in, I'm sitting in the back, and then you can feel just the uh, this twenty nine thousand pound vehicle probably come this far off the ground. I mean, it was huge. Wow. The overpressure was enormous. Fire immediately engulfed the inside of it. We sitting there with a hundred pounds of C four wrapped in the middle of and in this crate. Um, projectiles coming off the apartment filling up with smoke. Uh, me being part of the crew also, the, uh, so I have dual duties. I'm part of the crew, the Amtrak crew, and I pretty much know the, the back of the crew, and I always know, well, what if, if what if, what if, you know, if something happens, the best way to get out of here. So I'm sitting next to the hatch door, so I immediately open the hatch, the uh, personnel hatch, I you see that they they like I said I know I got guys behind me I need to get out of the way I dive out and I roll I remember rolling because I said I know there are guys on fire they're coming out behind me let me roll get out of their way because they're coming and um, that's what happened at that uh, that hatch and we, I'm looking in I'm getting a lot of guys out guys are on fire. Um, trying to put them out the best we could. Uh, I remember for some reason I I put put my gloves on for that. I, I was all gloved up before. I, a lot of times I wouldn't glove up until we got to the mission, but I was gloved up even. Um, so I was able to got to put the fire out as the guys were jumping off getting them out of the way so they wouldn't get hit by the other people that were on fire and just secure them over to the right side. Um, one of the guys was uh, Corporal Mankin. I just can't remember. Uh, I, I remember vividly. He was a combat photographer. He had taken videos of the house incident, the suicide bunker, and he let me watch the footage of that. And the people who pulled out and said, oh, man, you got good shots of you doing that and, and all of that. And I don't care, you know. But uh, they brought me up to the CP and we looked at it. And what, and they asked me, is that you? Or I said, yeah, that's me. And, um, so uh, I remember the commander saying thank you for looking after my Marines. And, and, and my Marines too, man. I'm not part of this unit, but we all work together, man. And the mission was getting them out of there. So I'm, I hate, I'm, I'm going back all, back and forth. But um, that's all right. I don't think I've ever told a complete story. I've told them part, parts of it. But so on, on the way out to, on the new mission, we're back in the game. We got reinforcements. We got a new. Um, um, Platoon commander, um, their first mission out of the gate is again, uh, Colonel Ollie North was filming and he was filming us leaving the uh, compound, the FOB, the forward operating base that we were sitting at temporarily. 
and he will cease. This all, all happened as part of one of his, uh, uh, the episode that he runs, the uh, combat stories. Mm -hmm. right? But um, just, just chaotic. I remember looking in the back of that, that Amtrak and just, hey, anybody come to the sound of my voice. Rounds were popping off. You know, and it became you know, very unsafe. I knew at some point our fuselage was going to explode. This was, you know, um, but uh, we got out there. We tried to get out everybody that we could. So, but uh, we know that um, there were people who didn't didn't make it. One. And we lost that sorry Ivy, the guy who had just a couple hours ago showed me his daughter mm. and said, hey, man, you know, I'm all about the mission and doing what we need to do, but we're not going to pick fights. And, you know, we kind of picked those fights with Staff Sergeant Goodwin. And, uh, we were glad to do it. it was like, hey, Josh, if it's going to go down, let's get it done. Let's get it going now. We marked through some of the graffiti that they would have up, up and just going, okay. Um, Staff Sergeant Iron was kind of letting us know, hey, we're not going to do that. It's, this, this little girl kind of changed things for me. And we, I'm all about mission or whatever we have to do, however it could be called. But just, we're not getting anything that, not mission specific. And I was all about it. I said, yes. Do I have I have kids myself and uh, need to be about the mission and getting our, getting our guys home. But he died. He was sitting in the troop commander position. The explosion got his legs tangled around his chair. He couldn't get out, even though he was in the troop commander. The hot fumes that were coming up through the troop commander's hatch went into his lungs burned his lungs and he couldn't be resuscitated in time yeah. so he died and well, there was a corporal grant 18 years old i remember um we kidded him because he was still a virgin i always talked about hey if you get back we're gonna get you fixed up with somebody <laughs> <laughs> Um, a lot of good guys, man. Yeah. You know, I think about one of the guilt for me instead of opening the personnel hatch, what if I'd hit the emergency ramp, which would have dropped the entire ramp? Well, that's a 600 pound door. Didn't know who was out there. Uh, didn't even know if it was still operational. I knew that the, uh, our crew was beat up bad. The driver, he could have opened the ramp. Good friend of mine, he was beat up. His whole mandible was messed up. Um, Corporal Schroederwitz um, was back there. He was burned severely bad. All good friends of mine. Um, it was just a bad day. Um, I'll get everybody back out to the uh, medivac, assist with that, and I kind of, I try to go back one more time. They said, no, there's nothing left. Don't, don't try to go back to the, to the MV. It's over, Willard. And my commanding officer told me, I remember it vividly. And just as he was telling me not to go back, it exploded again. Boom, I don't know. I probably the fuselage, I don't know, maybe the C4 had, had something to do with the explosion, but it just totally, you no, know, to the point where there's nobody could possibly be in there and still alive. So I'll go back to, over to the medevac and see if I could be of use, and I just kind of, like, oh, I just kind of lost it. To rarely just, you know, always, being a leader, always try to be, project myself as strong. But uh, looking at the medevac, looking at the wounded, looking at, thinking about what just happened two days prior, and it's, ah, 
Yeah. And just, just the anger is was just livid. And then somebody said, "Hey, you you got blood coming down your your arm." I said, "No, it's somebody else's blood there," because I was covered in blood. Anyway, I said, "No, that's a fresh trickle." And they took my, um, cut my clothes off, and yeah, strapped them. Hit. I hit my arm, and um, I said, "We got to get you to the medic." And I said, "No," but they they insisted, so I went to the medical. And um, being in there, it was like, it was hard. They charred Marines. The, um, everybody from just charred to trauma and everybody in between. I was in one of the rooms where, hey, just give me some bandage, give me some uh, antibiotic and let me get back on, on my way type. Deciding, well, we're gonna decide whether we're gonna take, try to remove it or let you keep it or whatever. So you got to go through the X-rays, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But I remember Colonel Davis and his staff and his sergeant major coming in, and they going into the room with the burnt bodies, and I really got to see the pain on those guys' face of being the leaders and commanders from from that. And uh, guys, I really respect to this day. When I saw the tear coming out of the sergeant major, he saw me and he kind of wiped it away. And I remember saying, I wish, hey, sergeant major, we're going to get him. We're going to get him. What we did was right. We're going to get him. Mm -hmm. And we kind of, you know, we kind of had a little moment there. Yeah. I don't think I've ever said that to anybody. But, uh, I wish, but, uh, and Those are my two big, and the problem, the biggest thing with that, and I tell people, you know, I'm not a hero. I just happen to be uh, that guy in in, a, in the moment and happen to be in, in the right place to try to help some people, to try to help my buddies make it home and complete the promise that I made to their family before we left. And I just happened, I don't know, hero just happened to be in those in a, in a position. But the biggest thing out of this, because this happened in May, we're not scheduled to leave till October. How do we go on? All right, we've been hammered. We even get reports that we were, the people that we left back at our home base were getting hammered. They find IED explosive in the fire extinguishers. So we were getting hammered. At this point, um, mustering the strength to go on as a leader, mustering the strength to encourage people, hey, come on, man, we, we still got a lot more. Mm -hmm. we, we, at this rate, you know, Marine Corps is not slowing up on their operations tempo at all. We're the main focus. Of this, we the main effort, and we gonna, and we still have work to do. And if we're gonna leave here, if any of us is gonna leave here, so, uh, we're gonna have to fight. It's gonna be a fight, and I think that is where um, the greatest strength is when you've been hit and knocked down, and. It looks like a loss. Everything looks like a loss at this point. Well, how do we go forward? We just got our ass kicked. Mm -hmm. How do we continue to go forward? And I think you bring up a, you know, I appreciate you telling the story in such vivid detail. And I think one of the things that people can see and one of the reasons why we're doing this is because, you know, when you're talking about that mission where it was a, you know, a pretty much a suicide house, right? Mm -hmm. Yet Marines are running in, getting shot, dying, but you guys just keep going, right? Like, yeah. I think that's why we're the country we are today is because of the men like you that do i know you didn't i know you said you're not a hero but that is some fucking heroic shit right there man to 
see what is going on in front of you and say, we got people to get out. Like we need, there's people in there that need our help. And you know, if it takes me dying doing it, then that's the way it's going to be. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm just getting the fucking chills just talking about it, man. Cause Absolutely. I'm so proud to serve with those guys. It did something more for me. Do you know how our generation, or each generation, look at the generation that comes behind us? Oh, these guys are softer. They don't have to iron camis. They don't even have to shine their boots. They come in with these boots or whatever. Are we creating a softer Marine? The answer to that is no. What I saw that day, and this carriage stuck with me even into the law enforcement. They do things a little different. You know, they have their cell phones, they were born with gadgets and they were doing some things. Different. But when the rubber meets the road, those guys were there. I'm so damn proud to have served with those guys. We didn't ever have to find, look for anybody to go back into those buildings, or anybody to try to help get Marines off the burning tracks and people got wanted trying to get burning Marines off that off that vehicle. And, um, you know, I just played a small part, man, but there was so much, there was so many heroic efforts uh, in both, both of those incidents that uh, I was, you know, I was proud. Yeah. I felt good. I felt good and I felt like, um, I don't know if I'm gonna make it to October. I don't know if I'll, but uh, if I gotta go, I'm around some good people. If this is the way it's got to, this is the way it ends for me, I'm, I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. I'm all right because I'm around some good people. People I'm willing to go all the way with and I know they're, they'll go all the way with me. Um, when, did you, uh, when did you get out of the Marines, Dennis? Um, things took a turn. Uh, my story wasn't quite over with that. We, we made it. Somehow we made it. We, we ended up flying out. We did. Well, Hurricane Katrina had hit while we were mm -hmm. over there. It had hit that, uh, September 30th. And, um, a lot of our guys were affected because a lot of our guys were from South Mississippi, South Louisiana. New Orleans area. So, uh, can we get back? No heroes welcome, no nothing. Everybody's, just, it looks like you're going back into another war zone. It looks like, uh, this looks like Iraq, some of the places that were, were bombed. So we get there, um, you know, we had to beg and plead because we were initially supposed to um, uh, decompress in, in Lejeune for about a month, but we get there for about a week and we all depend, hey, I need, we need to go home. We don't even know if our homes are standing. We don't know what, a lot of our families are dislocated, living in FEMA camps, FEMA trailers and everything like that. So we get down there and it was just like we thought and I had lost everything, and several of my other buddies. So we go into another mission, nice mission, more personal, about trying to restore your home, your life, get your kids back in some kind of education, trying to store back some type of normalcy within the normalcy of coming back from uh, from combat. So we have two things going on. I uh, asked my mother, because I didn't have a vehicle, it was destroyed in the hurricane. I asked my mother to drop me off at the Ford dealership. I bought a truck. I pretty much drove out here with clothes on my back, sea bag, and I tested for LA County Sheriff's Department. And uh, wow, I made it. They uh, passed the test. I uh, put my folder certificates that I'd already accumulated from being a, a previous police officer, fell in the grace place and put them in the right hands. And the lady said, well, how much can you complete of your application package? I said, lady, I don't have anything to go back to. I don't, my job was destroyed. Cause at that time I was working on a uh, patrol, uh, mm -hmm. Marine patrol, I was, I was a boat operator. 
all our boats, we didn't have a fleet anymore. The chief at that time told me, you can come back. You, you always got a job you want, but we just don't have anything for you to do. So came out here, applied. She was like, how long can you stay in town? Knock out the rest of this outfit. I said, I have nothing to go back to. Nothing. My family just dislo dislocated. They're in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I'm living in a FEMA trailer, and it's got mold in it. I got nothing to go for. I'm here. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. <laughs> so I knocked out a lot of that packet, thanks to that lady. And, and, um, I pretty much call her LAPD, say, hey, don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, I'm good with uh, the sheriff's department at this point. Mm -hmm. And so the rest is history. I've uh, wow. met some really good people um, out, out here. And um, How long have you been with the sheriffs? I've been with them 15 years now. Wow. Going on 16 years. Immediately after, I just came on over. Um, but things started to start catching up with me. You can only outrun the the uh, the uh, broken emotions for so long, and they started to catch up with me. I can't say every day was was sunny, had good days and bad days, but that's when I started building, realizing, okay, family's safe. I got my family out, got my kids out here. They're in school. They're you know embracing the new opportunities that come with being in California. Um, but I need to start trying to tie up some of these loose ends to help myself for the long haul. And I realize I'm drinking a little too much, just not seeing things too quick, uh, as clearly as I need to. So. Uh, and then uh, did you seek help through the VA? Uh, yes, uh, my wife at the time uh, was noticing me. Um, horrible nightmares. The um, just not feeling safe. You know, that I, it's just feeling like uh, and it's not like the hyper vigilance is good. Uh, out on the streets and working in the jail, but not so good when you're trying to relax. And you're trying to have dinner with your wife, or just trying to, and then the lack of sleep, and it was an edge. I was, you know, just not, uh, it's just not who I needed to be. I knew I was feeling bad. I didn't know, didn't know how to recognize the triggers. What, what made, was it the box on the side of the road that I passed on the way home? Um, was it just, Anything that, you know, sometimes going to the range, hearing the gunfire. And we work near the range and you hear you hear gunfire and it's like it's kind of and just not being able to notice. And that was the benefit of getting some you know, I went to the VA at the request of my wife at the time and I was just doing it really to shut her up, get her off my back and say, Yeah, okay, yeah. And I'm all trying to salvage what's left of this marriage. It was my second one at the time, second marriage. And salvage was what's left of it. Um, so whatever, whatever you want me to do, I'll go to the VA. So I went there and I started talking to some counselors and, and meeting people that were, were like me. And that right there was huge. I remember uh, <coughs> talking, speaking to the first gentleman, and he was saying the things that I was feeling. Didn't know how to put into words at that time, but I had no, absolutely no mental health um, counseling. I didn't know the terminology. I didn't know anything. I just remember him. I'm like, yeah, how do you know? I, I, yeah, I got, I, I'm there. I was a veteran myself. I'm trying to tell you. And so is he. So is he. And we're all, and he's said in the group. I was like, man. So I started, it was started in a group therapy type thing. And I was, man, I was a dick. Man, I, I had to be there. 
Because these guys, these are sort of like some people who, who I saw out of eye with, and these are some people who, um, they know, they know mm -hmm. what, we're, what I'm talking about without me even having to say it. So that's where it started, to be up in uh, San Fernando Valley for me. And um, then so I started going to an even more personal one-on-one -on -one counseling session with Dr. Song over at uh, West Ed. And he, he knew the right questions to ask and it just really, really helped. Awesome. That's great. It really helped. Um, that's great. That's awesome. Uh, you know, I've heard that from a lot of vets that they, uh, you know, it really helps them out to, uh, to be around other veterans that really know what's going on. And, and uh, just how you described it right now, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing the other vets talk and realizing, hey, he's describing what's happening to me. Um, so, uh, which is another reason why you're sitting in this seat today, uh, because we want other veterans to see not just, you know, the a community of supporters, but other vets that are going through stuff like this right now, yes. uh, especially with all the recent events in Afghanistan and yes. everything, oh um, uh, you know, we'll, uh, you know, we're trying to do everything we can to help them out. Um, and, uh, you know, you being here today is a, is a you know, means more than to, to me and uh, to what we're doing here than I think more than you know, man, it's yeah. uh, from the bottom of my heart. So, um, so thank you. Um, well, before we cut the tape, uh, Dennis, you know, I just want to let, you know, if you have any last words, uh, anything else you want to say before we, you know, just thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, it, it helps. Um, it's 15 years now with some of this stuff. It's just like it was brand new. And I thank you for the opportunity to share. Uh, on behalf of uh, those great men and women that we lost, those that are wounded, they'll never be the same. Some of them I, I still stay in contact with now. Over burns, over 90% of the body. Uh, dealing with the aftermath, carry it on. Um, I salute them, um, the people we lost in Afghanistan. And, um, you know, it's, it's for them that I tell my story. The ones that can't tell the story, uh, make sure that their memory is not lost, that their children know that they, what they meant to us, uh, it's probably the best way we can try to remember them and to honor their service. Let's not let them forget and help those people that uh, were wounded. Let them know, hey man, I don't care what the end result of Afghanistan is or Iraq is, your service uh, was honorable and it was valuable. And we all take that away from um, from our efforts, we can have some kind of peace about, but regardless of what the outcome is, we don't know. Absolutely. Right. Well, thanks again, Dennis, and uh, you know, Semper Fi, brother. Thank you, Semper Fi, Josh. Push it to the limit, I can't go no more. Red light, no 